Hello everyone, today we're going to be doing the Teologia Moralis by St. Alphonsus Liguori. We will be doing two corollaries with the dissertation and two monitums. The first corollary, which we've heard many, many times, is that a doubtful law does not oblige. The reason Alphonsus is so focused on this is that at his time there was the group of extremely strict moral theologians called rigorists who would say that certain kinds of doubtful law certainly obliged people. Um, so Alphonsus took great exception to this and he writes against them very often. A law only obliges as promulgated. A doubtful law is not sufficiently promulgated, therefore a doubtful law does not oblige. This is the simple reason, um, yeah. Uh, you can render things certain in practice, but not in speculation. So if, say, the action of having the fourth biscuit, having four biscuits, is that greedy? Is that greedy? Well, maybe speculatively it isn't, but a person who doesn't know all the principles will have doubts about that, so they could happily eat the fourth biscuit. Uh, that would make it moral or not evil for them to, to do that in practice, even in, if in speculation it would be a problem. Against rigorism. Of all opinions, those that are the most strict should be assumed to be true of the opinions that are less than morally certain. Uh, this is the strict opinion of rigorism. I misdefined it in an earlier video. It was pointed out to me in a comment by well, I can't say his name. Um, yeah, and the problem with this is that it is against both freedom and reason, for certainly, certainty is required for obligation, not simply being the most restrictive. You, know, you could have a hypothetical doubtful law which just restricted you to laying in your bed all day, and because it was doubtful and other laws are also doubtful, you would actually be bound to hold the most restrictive law. That, that would be dumb. Uh, a doubt. Two equally probable opinions do not oblige either position, but they do introduce a doubt about either position. Uh, this means that if you're simply in a situation where you have a doubt about one position or another, you're actually bound to dig a little deeper, because you have vincible ignorance now. You have a doubt about the truth of the goodness of one action over another and you need to settle this as soon as you can. If you don't, you'll be invincible. You will be invincible ignorance, not invincible ignorance. Uh, and as we said in the first video on the series, anyone who acts invincible ignorance is always culpable for some sin, uh, either in failing to discover the truth of a matter or in acting against what their conscience believes to be good. Now remember, in discovering the truth of a matter, you only, need to uh, you only need to make a common effort. You don't need to make a Heraclean scientific effort. Um, yeah. Eternal law. Creatures are only obliged to follow eternal law insofar as it has been, as it has been promulgated to them through civil law, natural law, and divine positive law. Uh, these are, in fact, the way that we know eternal law. Eter like, eternal law encompasses all of these things, and these other things are only laws insofar as they participate and reflect the eternal law. Uh, natural law. Uh, this is something which is promulgated to people at their creation. Uh, it's the intrinsic first principles which are known by reason, the things you know immediately, like you should not kill an innocent, you should not curse the Lord your God. Um, and then secondary precepts are known by extrapolation. So you take the first principles and you uh, run them through a logic machine. You say, okay, I've got principles one and two, and they give me proposition three, like you shall not curse God. Saying X thing about God would be a curse, therefore you should not say X thing about God. That would be a secondary precept known by extrapolation. Okay, now we have the second corollary. An uncertain law cannot induce a certain obligation, because for a man, libertas possidet, previous to the obligation of the law. 
Remember, libertas possidet means liberty has possession, the man can choose. We have some objections to the principle here. Uh, the only thing that is required for promulgation is probable knowledge. Okay. Uh, eternal law proceeds from free. Uh, eternal law proceeds freedom. So, in doubtful matters, the law possesses, not liberty. Nothing is lawful unless it conforms to the divine law. In doubtful matters, the safer way must be chosen. The reason this one is in quotes is because that is a proposition that was promulgated by the magisterium. Uh, so that has magisterial weight behind it. And then finally, he who loves danger shall perish in it from Ecclesiastes. Responses. If a law is only probable, then there is a lack of certainty which is required for actual action. Uh, there must be knowledge of the eternal law for it to oblige, but if there is doubt of it, certain knowledge is not present. A will cannot do so, for no man knows the entire design of God. It is only possible for the will to conform to laws that it knows. Uh, the doubts that are spoken of in this section are practical, not speculative. If you have a practical doubt, Alphonsus has already admitted in the first uh, chapter that you uh, sin if you act in practical doubt. But if speculative doubt, there is no problem. And then finally, overreach in the application of doubtful laws is potentially as evil as neglecting plausible laws. Also, it definitionally neglects the prudent reasons for the doubt. You could have good reasons for doubting that a certain law is true. Maybe you have probabilistic reasons to think another law is true. Now, the first monitum, in which a decree of the sacred congregation of the General Inquisition held in Rome in 1761 in regard to the use of probable opinions is explained. Uh, in 1760, there was a pamphlet that was released in Italy. It contained ten propositions on the subject of uh, the use of probable opinion, and later, in uh, 1761, the pamphlet was condemned as a pamphlet, as a group, and some propositions were condemned in particular. Uh, now, Alphonsus is interested in this because one of the propositions condemned relates to the freedom to choose the less probable opinion, or to choose the probable opinion which is equally probable but does not favor the law. Uh, this pamphlet and the propositions were later clarified, and there's very good reason to think that the propositions Alphonsus was interested in were not actually condemned, and that only the pamphlet as a whole, as well as one or two of the propositions, specifically Proposition 10, were condemned. And then the second monitum, Petutius, biographers! I love this. There wasn't a name for this monitum, so I gave it. I get. I took the liberty. You know, libertas possidet. <laughs> okay, and this has a funny story. So uh, there was a biography, a biographer of a man named Petutius. Petutius was a rival of Alphonsus. Petutius, as far as I can tell, was a more rigorous moral theologian who had stricter opinions, and often Alphonsus is writing against him in, specific, uh, in particular. Uh, the biographer uh, accuses Alphonsus of attempting to censure Petutius as a result of the fact that Alphonsus had no response to his genius big brain arguments. Uh, this is, in fact, false, and Alphonsus lists all of the tracks that they wrote against each other over the years. Uh, and finally in this section, in defense of the second corollary, uh, which Petutius had attacked many times, as well as the first corollary, um, Alphonsus quotes, I believe, Augustine, uh, we must fear a conscience that is too liberal, as well as one that is too strict. 
So the first generates presumption, the second desperation. And I think that's an excellent note to end this series on. Thank you for listening.